please welcome Admiral James Stavridis and Juliet Kayam. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Juliette Kayyem, and I'm thrilled to be here with the Admiral uh, discussing cybersecurity. Uh, we know it's been a long conference, and we know we're at the end of it, so we're grateful that you're all here. Oh, wow. Thank you. Great to see everybody here. Um, the main reason I get invited is because every year the organizers want one person who is willing to put on a necktie. <laughs> Besides the security <laughs> force, it's just me and the security people, so that tie is for you. No, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. So this is a little bit of a different kind of keynote. We figured you guys have all, uh, you and gals, have all been keynoted out, and so we thought we'd just take the opportunity. The Admiral and I have known each other for a long time both in government and outside of government, we thought we'd take the opportunity to actually just have a conversation about major themes around cybersecurity. Uh, cybersecurity is a big topic, we know, and so we're going to focus today on the topics that you know really well um, around national security, military security, and I will chime in on homeland security, which is where my background is. So that's how we're sort of going to play it out the next 50 minutes, and, um, and just want to thank you for being here in your service, um, uh, you know, now in the private sector, but in in academia and in the public sector. Well, thanks, and I'll return the compliment. There are a lot of ways to serve the country, and your work as Assistant Secretary at Homeland Security helped make this country safe, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. So let's start with uh, the big themes, or the, mm -hmm. the big problems, which is essentially nation-state aggression against the United States, um, uh, and this low warfare, uh, cheap kind of attacks uh, um, on our critical infrastructure and cybersecurity. Uh, one of the challenges, I think, when we talk about it, it's very hard to prioritize. So when you think about it, is it, should we prioritize it by country, or is there another way to think about those kinds of risks? Now, it's a great question. I think I'm going to organize it by country to just kind of very quickly hit the four principal countries that are involved geopolitically in mounting threat to the United States in this sphere, and none of them are gonna surprise you. Yeah. Let's start with Russia. Russia comes at us in kind of three vectors, right? Uh, number one, they uh, are developing and increasing their ability in offensive cyber capability that, as you know very well, um, has a precision-guided component to it that looks at our national critical infrastructure. Number two, most uh, Ocaron, most of the moment, is the fact that Russia is going to interfere in our election in 2020. They did interfere in our election in 2016. So that's a, a particular specific niche, and I hope we can come back yep. to that. And then uh, number three, Russia, and this is very different than the other two, Russia operates a kind of uh, public-private partnership with black hat cyber criminal gangs and effectively issues letters of mark to these black hatters, much like Queen Elizabeth did to Sir Francis Drake, go forth and commit piracy on behalf of England. Uh, today it's go forth and do cyber criminal activity. We're going to tax you. And it's kind of like the godfather. <laughs> At some point, we will come and ask of you a favor. It's, it's a very clever construct. So. That's Russia as a yeah. package. Secondly, Juliet, and it's been a big topic of the conversation here at RSA, of course, is China. Here it's a different basket of threat vector. I think uh, what I worry about the most is, obviously, intellectual property theft, but not, if you will, garden variety, but when it entails high-end military stealth capabilities or propulsion, uh, jet engines, uh, increasingly, it might go after artificial intelligence and other really high-end crown jewels. Uh, China does very effective job there, and, and they do it with a very sophisticated, blended, almost interagency kind of approach that brings together uh, civilian hackers, much like in Russia. It involves their cyber force. They have a cyber force. You know, we have an Army, a Navy, a Marine Corps, uh, and an Air Force, but we don't have a cyber force. I think we should. Um, that's part of this. 
And as well, they also use Chinese commercial capability. And finally, they use good old-fashioned humans, insider threat. We've seen some folks recently indicted as a result of this. So it's a sophisticated and very clever model. So that's kind of China. And then very quickly, North Korea, it's your garden variety thugocracy. It's all about the money for Kim Jong-un. He wants his cyber capability to generate cash. That's why WannaCry uh, ransomware was, came out of North Korea. It was a funding stream for the young leader. And then secondly, occasionally, he will unleash these cyber attack dogs when he's irritated or annoyed. You might have seen this really terrible movie that came out several years ago called The Interview. It's one of the worst movies in the history of movies. I talk about it, and as an act of professional diligence, I said to myself, you know, I really ought to watch that movie. <laughs> Made it through about 14 minutes. But believe me, Kim Jong-un watched the whole movie because it makes him look kind of stupid. So he unleashed a cyber attack against Sony Pictures, an American a uh, large American company and did hundreds of millions of dollars in kinetic damage. So that's kind of North Korea, ego-driven and money. Lastly, Iran, we, we ought to be very careful here, and you know this very yeah. well from your days in the department, and I'd, I'd love to hear how it looks from the, the domestic side, side in yeah. a moment. But Iran is nudging into the big leagues in their ability to start targeting key sectors and they're very interested in our big banks, our financial sector, and they are also quite interested in uh, dams, water. I'm on the board of American Water, a large public utility. We see them edging around. Um, so they are not so much about money as they are about learning how to be a threat to the United States. And I'll conclude here. They also take those cyber means and use them against Israel, against Saudi Arabia, against the Gulf states, our allies, partners, and friends in the Middle East. So that's a quick sketch. How about from the domestic well, perspective I mean, looking at that? Yeah, so, you know, from the Homeland Security side, the the perpetrator was of less interest simply because we didn't have uh, the means to respond to it, whether it was Russia or Iran. I mean, I think the challenges that we experienced uh, were uh, twofold. I mean, one is just the governance challenge. We tend to think of uh, cybersecurity as, oh, .mil, .gov domain. Uh, you know, the critical infrastructure is owned 60, 70 percent by the private sector. Um, uh, and state and local governments retain a lot of information about you um, and about, you know, we, whether it's your driver's licenses or this new real ID that could be easily accessed too. So the challenge, uh, I often say in Homeland Security, it's the security is the easy part the homeland is the hard part because without standards about what kind of cybersecurity protections, even outside of elections, where there's been a lot of focus, and we'll get to that, um, uh, that is of concern to me. It's a sort of the state and local aspects of those vulnerabilities. We tend to focus on the .mil and the federal .gov domain. I think the second issue, and it's funny you brought up Sony. I actually assigned the movie for my class. It is awful. Uh, it's <laughs> awful on the you know, seventh time. Um, but the reason why um, uh, it's a perfect example of uh, one of the challenges we had in the public-private um, partnership aspect, and this applies to a lot of you, is um, for companies that don't view themselves as security companies, for them to take seriously their cyber vulnerabilities. So if you're a critical infrastructure, you were saying you're border, if you're a critical infrastructure entity, you're... Um, I mean, you know that you're vulnerable, especially if you're, you know, PG&E or a water company. You know you're, vul you know you're vulnerable and you're going to have to sort of commit the resources. Sony is a perfect example, a Japanese company with a, a American uh, uh, distribution on this side. Um, it had uh, uh, cybersecurity, but one wouldn't have called it particularly sophisticated. When we looked back at how it happened, it was a, essentially a single point of failure. It was a system administrator's password got the, got the 
the North Americans, uh, North Koreans into the entire system. And Sony, you know, will say, like, they never sort of envision themselves as sort of a national security <laughs> threat. But I think that there's no distinction now that you could go after, you know, in the same way terrorists could go after Disneyland, and that would be the same as if they went after the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. um, cyber, uh, uh, you know, war, you know uh, a foreign country uh, could do the same with a private company that does not see itself as in critical for infrastructure. So getting that group of companies, you know, to the level that you would feel good about is, yeah. is difficult. I think this opens a, a just a gut question, yeah. which is what are the responsibilities of the U.S. government to defend all of us in the cyber world? Yeah. And, and if I ask you, uh, well, let, let's imagine a scenario where there's a brand new U.S. cruise ship and let's say it got built in Korea, which builds really, really nice cruise ships. And that cruise ship had no passengers on it. It was just being effectively ferried back to the United States. Those cruise ships cost a couple of hundred million dollars. And if I said to you, well, what do you think the U.S. response would be, and who's responsible if the North Koreans sent a submarine out, put a torpedo in the side, and sank it? You would all say, the Department of Defense. Of course the military is going to do that. Just like Juliet's point, if, if Disneyland were under attack, it would be, you know, send the Marines to Disneyland. Uh, that's obvious. But in this cyber world, we just haven't worked this out yet. Yeah. And so uh, when something happens like the Sony attack, and I would call that an attack, yeah. this is a couple of hundred million dollars of kinetic damage and a couple of hundred million dollars of business capital that are lost. And to me, that looks a lot like an attack, but you know, the Department of Defense wasn't called in. There was a kind of, the response was very mild. It was kind of, let's flicker the internet in North Korea to show them we can <laughs> do it. Uh, you know, if, if they had sunk a US asset like that, it would have been line up the B-2 bombers. So. I'm not advocating that, <laughs> by the way. Uh, what I do think we need to do, and, and you and I are a pretty good tag team yeah. on this, military, homeland security, is where are those lines and what are the responsibilities right. for the government? And I think the government needs to pick up more of this. We're putting too much of this burden on the private sector, in my view. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I think that's absolutely right, just because they're, um, their access to intelligence will be very different as well. So, um, and, and you know, n the countries that may be a threat are probably well known to these companies, but how they might go about it and the vulnerability that these companies might have uh, is, you know, something that is unique to them. Unlike, you know, most of the companies represented here, they're sophisticated yeah. in this stuff. I want to um, move, though, because we, we have so many things we want to talk about, and I, obviously the election and um, election security. Sure. Um, so I want to just try to disaggregate from the homeland side uh, three different issues, and I want to just focus on one uh, with the admiral. Uh, so there's disinformation, which is, you know, that's the, you know, sort of lies and other things put on websites and, and the responsibility of social media platforms and the use by the Russians of, of those platforms. That's not really a, it's not really a cyber issue, but that's an election issue and sort of their obligation. So, you know, the idea that the number one story in Pennsylvania, uh, areas of Catholic areas of Pennsylvania on Facebook leading up to the election in 2016 was that the Pope had indeed endorsed Donald Trump. You know, that is something that we know, you and I all know is a lie, but for people who may not get their information from other sources, didn't. So that's the disinformation. That continues to happen. That's the debate you're hearing about the social media platforms. The second is Iowa, um, which is just technology is bad sometimes, right? I mean, it's just as that was a stupid use of an app. You didn't even need to use an app, and we'll get better at, if we need to use an app, not deploying it on the day of the most watched election and caucus um, of our time, right? So that was just sort of, but it did raise, I think, the third issue, which is um, the vulnerabilities, whether it's through technology or through a, a, an outside actor of our election system. And so when you think about, you know, 2018 happened, 2020 is soon. When you think about your confidence level, mm -hmm. um, where is it right now in terms of election security? And are we run, have we run out of time, though, in the sense that it started? Yeah, I, you know, my confidence level is very high. 
My confidence is high that the Russians are going yeah. to intrude. My confidence is high that they will have impact doing so. And, and I like your construct. I think the social media, uh, deep fake, fake news, I, I think of that as kind of the strategic level. Yeah. And then I think there's an operational level, which you didn't mention. I just want to throw it out there. It is the vulnerability of the campaigns. Mm -hmm. And if you think back to 2016, I think a lot of sand in the gears, in this case for the Democrats, was the hacking of John Podesta, the campaign chief for Hillary Clinton, and the distribution of a great many embarrassing emails. It kind of undermined confidence. So the vulnerability of those campaigns who are not even using WhatsApp. Yeah. I mean, they are just using Gmail, sending a lot of sensitive material. And here I mean both the Trump campaign and all of the current Democratic campaigns. I think we better up our game yeah. there. And uh, to do that, you need things like end-to-end -end encryption, which I'm on the board of a small company, Prevail, which is doing this. It's a, one example of how we need to harden these kinds of things. And then I think this is where you were going, Juliet, is down at the level of precincts and municipalities and cities and counties and states, um, will the Russians drill into those? I think they will. Yeah. And I, I don't think they're sophisticated enough, the Russians, to figure out the six most important counties in, Iowa, in Ohio and twist the, the ballots just enough to flip a state. I, I don't think that's the game. I think what they will want to do is destroy confidence in the process and make our national election look like Iowa. Yeah. Your point, we need to guard against that. That means more resources, more training for local officials, and hey, newsflash, the clock is ticking. We got 250 days to get it done. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that you're seeing just on the, on the defense and homeland security side, so if you thought, um, just picking up on your point, the confidence level, although this m could impact um, the act of voting itself. So if, you, if you're the Russians and you're thinking, and this is just all hypothetical, but you've been reading the newspaper in terms of uh, briefings about sort of the Russians' interest and in, in the Bernie Sanders campaign and the Donald Trump campaign. So if you're um, the Russians and you want Michigan to go to a certain candidate, um, how do you swing 20,000 votes? That's really hard to do undetected uh, by switching 20,000 votes, right, in Detroit. Exactly. But what you could do is, um, and this, is the, this gets back to our first point, is you could um, somehow impact the apparatus that supports voting. So one of the things you're starting to hear the intelligence community talk about publicly in their most recent sort of election uh, brief, public briefing, is uh, you could, you know, sort of... Uh, impact the signals uh, in Detroit so that African-American communities could not get to the polls quickly. And if people can't afford to spend four hours voting or you get into the reverse 9-11 system and say there's an active shooter um, or you, you impact the elect uh, electricity and you know, if you can hit 10 precincts in Detroit, you significantly change the African-American, you know, it's voter suppression of a different kind. Mm. So I think it's not just the you know, the, the sort of ballot box, mm -hmm. right? Which it's, it's hard to do undetected and there's ways that we're beginning to be able to detect it. it and we also have paper ballots now in many places. It's that, it's that mm -hmm. infrastructure that supports the voting yeah. and that, that gets to your point, which yeah. is confidence. Yeah, exactly. And I think just to put a, a line under what, what Julia just said, um, at the end of the day, I think the Russians are less interested in exactly who the president is and who the vice president. What they want, what they relish, is this polarization in the society, is this distrust of government itself, this acrimony. We're, we're in such an angry political season. And the reason the Russians want that is because it distracts us. It distracts us from what Russia is doing geopolitically in the world. It gives them a freer hand to continue to occupy Ukraine, to support a war criminal like Bashar al-Assad in Syria, to uh, lean into uh, Eastern Europe and do these same kinds of things to try and manipulate and drive down confidence. So uh, we're playing the home game, but believe me, it is impacted, our away game is impacted when we have to put resources and attention here in the country. The, uh, just picking up on that point, the sort of 
the fissures in our society. So we, we see the Russians very engaged with the anti-vax movement, so sort of those fissures about sort of public health. And now you're starting to see disinformation campaigns with support of the Russians um, as well, those fissures around the coronavirus, those fissures. Is it, are the Chinese hiding a bioterrorism attack? No one in the field actually believes that. You know, sort of these fissures that make us distracted from what we need to do, which is protect U.S. society from a potential pandemic. A absolutely, and the latest uh, strain of that, not to, not to make a bad pun on, on <laughs> medicine, but the latest strain of disinformation that I've seen over the last couple of days is very chilling, mm -hmm. and it is starting to pop in a variety of social networks, which is that coronavirus is gonna be so bad that we are going to postpone our election. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Yeah. Never happened in American history. And yet, I feel the Russian voice in mm. that. And talk about an instantly polarizing issue, because on the left, people will say, oh, conspiracy. This is a way to just kind of prolong the current administration. On the right, they will say that this is, gonna, this is being done to undermine the legitimacy of the election, the re-election, in their view of President Trump. So uh, the Russians see this again as a wedge issue, and it is a really dark corner yeah. of the coronavirus that, unfortunately, I think you'll hear more of. Yeah. Another example of yeah. this. Yeah, and no, I think, and I want to add, so the military, you spent your career in the military, um, uh, spends a lot of time, you know, thinking about training and education and when i when we talk about this issue you can get so frustrated because we act like the american public doesn't sort of have a responsibility to to sort of educate itself so so getting to the are there solutions yeah um when you think about what the Russians are likely to do in 2020 and the confidence, how can we begin to prepare ourselves for essentially an enemy attack? Yeah. Or are we too divided? I mean, that's the sort of, I don't want you to say yes to that last question. <laughs> and, and, and I think the answer is no, we're not. And, and history of our country and our culture tells us that we have divisive moments, right? We have 1968, which believe me, I'm old enough to remember, and we were more divided. There was more political anger in the network in 1968, even than there is today. Um, we had a civil war, mm -hmm. newsflash, in 1860 to 1864 that killed uh, millions of Americans. Uh, so we've had very divided moments before, and Juliet, we tend to rise above those moments and come back, and I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that this will be the case. So the question is, what can we do that helps that? You touched on one, and it's education. Um, and, and this is not just cyber, but let's keep it in the cyber context. It's recognizing that um, right now we are teaching our children a great deal these days in the schools about many important life skills. Are we really teaching them about this supercomputer that they're carrying around? Are we teaching them, important point here, how to differentiate between fake news and real news? There are a dozen good techniques that can be taught to do that. Education is, is a fundamental part. Number two is we ought to, um, in my view, consider strongly the idea of a national service that could include cyber service and, and finding the cyber talent. And you're gonna see a very important report come out in the next couple of weeks. It's called the Solarium Report, commissioned by Congress, and it's about how to reorganize the government in sensible ways to focus us more on cyber. I think the recommendations there are quite good, and we ought to consider them. And third and finally, in terms of protecting ourselves as we go forward, um, again, back to a, a conversation we had a moment ago, yeah. Department of Defense and its role. I think that currently we have kind of a pickup team in the Department of Defense. Each of the services contributes to U.S. Cyber Command. I think it's time to start thinking about a cyber force, just like we have an air force. There's three ideas. So uh, w can I draw down on this? What do you mean by cyber force sure. as compared to cyber command? Because people, yeah. maybe you don't understand the tr difference in the terminology. Yeah. 
Um, so what currently exists is not bad, and it is a four-star officer who is the commander of U.S. Cyber Command. His name is General Paul Nakasone. Before him, it was Admiral Mike Rogers. Before him, it was General Keith Alexander. Four-star military officer. That officer goes to each of the services, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and says, send me some folks who can come work for me, I'm going to kind of integrate them and train them, and they will be the nation's military cyber force. That's what we have now. It's kind of a pickup team. It's not terrible, but it should be obvious to everybody that it would be much better if what we had instead was a small force. And I'd say, Juliet, this could be as small as 15,000 people. Department of Defense has 2 million people in it. So 15,000 highly trained very smart people who are focused from the moment they take their commission, the moment they raise their hand and swear allegiance to the Constitution of the United States, they are focused on cyber and cybersecurity. They're not a Marine rifleman who comes in for three glorious years into cyber and then goes back to being a Marine rifleman. That's not a good model. A better model is we bring the best and the brightest into this. And we have an example of having done this. It's called the U.S. Air Force. Hmm. You may recall that for the first almost 200 years of our history, we had an Army, a Navy, and a Marine Corps. We didn't have an Air Force, largely because we didn't fly airplanes until <laughs> the end of that period. But from the time we started to fly airplanes, just like now, we're in a world where cyber really matters. We figured it out, and we created an Air Force. I think it's time to put the basics out there to start. Yeah. So, I mean, talking about the military, um, one of the uh, concerns, and we talked about this at the beginning, is sort of the vulnerability of the network yes. around the dot mil domain. So from the, as I, I was saying at the beginning, from the, you know, from the Homeland Security perspective, one, we have no jurisdiction over the dot mil domain, but you kind of think the Pentagon's got their act together. There's almost no, no resource that DHS could um, help DOD with, and they've got a lot of incentive to protect. And I think one of the things that we're seeing when you see, okay, there's no real distinction between private and public anymore. What a lot of you do is quasi-public sector, right? You are supporting a, a public mission or public good by supporting DOD or Department of Energy or, or whoever else. Um, that network, though, seems to me to be a rather large vulnerability. Um, and there's been a lot of changes at the way the Pentagon is thinking about it in the same way you know, we got to get Sony to think about it. And uh, you've yeah. been involved with that. So I just thought it'd be helpful to have people sort of understand what is, what is that sure. looking like now and what changes can they expect? Yeah, let, let, let's start with um, acquisition, which is buying stuff and buying services. So buying things and buying services. That's a lot of what the Department of Defense does. The budget of the Department of Defense is like $780 billion. Big chunk of that goes to personnel but an awful lot of it acquires both services and goods. How many companies do you think are involved hmm. in that, what's called technically the defense industrial base? The answer is 300,000. There are 300,000 separate entities who provide goods and services to the Department of Defense. They range from massive prime contractors like Lockheed Martin, uh, Northrop Grumman, to tiny little wonderful innovative, hip, cool companies who come to RSA for the popcorn, and they are here doing <laughs> great things for the country with nine people working for them. Now, up here, the primes have a lot of resources to put at this idea of cybersecurity. Those little, small, cool, hip companies, not so much. Now, some of them, of course, are in cybersecurity. Those are pretty well defended. But the ones who are making special alloys for the knife edges on a J-35 Joint Strike Fighter, they're not so strong in this area. So many of you, I hope, had a chance to hear from Katie Arrington yesterday, who is leading a charge at the Department of Defense to create a set of standards so that before you get that contract, before you join the defense industrial base, you have to, let me shift metaphors for a minute, to karate. It's like a series of belts, and there's yeah. five belts. The white belt, like when your kid is in the dojo for the first time, <laughs> the white belt is the very basic stuff. You know what a fishing attack is. You have some level of point defense. You have a 
kind of a resilience plan. And it, it graduates to, uh, you know, a green belt, yellow belt, brown belt, like a black belt. That's pretty serious stuff. To do classified material, you got to have that level three. And so, for the first time, the department is trying to create some standards, and at each level, it describes exactly what you have to do to achieve that level, just like in karate. And so, I think that's a big step in the right direction. Uh, Katie Arrington is just a force of nature and is driving this thing forward. And, and I'll close by saying, Juliet, that I think this is a pretty good example of where the government can do something reasonable, set up those standards, and then I would say the government has another level of responsibility on the security side, which is to provide some resources, particularly to help these small, innovative companies, because otherwise they're going to kind of die on the vine of cybersecurity. So this is, this is big casino, what's yeah. happening, and I think uh, the quicker we get to a set of standards, the better. So, and those standards will be uh, this is the CMMC program. It so is. the cybersecurity model. Do we know? Now I'm forgetting. Cybersecurity maturity model. Maturity model certification. Right. Again, the belt system is the certification S word. So, I mean, to the extent CMMC um, is likely to impact a lot of people in this room sure. um, in terms of uh, sort of creating a, at least a baseline of what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Um, uh, and what's the bare minimum of what they're supposed to do? Because if you think about the supply chain servicing the Department of Defense, and we'll get into this later, uh, this is, you know, if, if DOD does this and does it well, it will have other, other agencies are going to look at it and go, well, we are Big important time. too. Like, you Big know, we, you know, so. So the first thing to know about it is that, um, you will not, if you're one of these small companies or, or a large company, you can't simply raise your hand and say, okay, we're all done, I'm level five. Uh, and you also can't raise your hand, say, we're all done, I'm level five, and here's my documentation. That's an improvement. Yeah. What you are gonna have to have is a certification from an outside uh, authority. And so the department is in, also in the business of creating mechanisms for these outside authorities who will be the certifiers. So step one, if you're a small business or a large business, step one is understand exactly what the requirements are at every level and figure out where you need to be based on your level of ambition in dealing with the Department of Defense. It's a no-brainer that Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, BAE, et cetera, they've got to be black belts. They've got to be up there at level five. But for a lot of companies, you may be quite comfortable being a level three. And I don't think we have time to unpackage all of yeah. the specifics here, but there are five levels. There are 13 uh, domains hmm. where you find uh, various ideas, and there are about 173 requirements. I mean, it is a government program, yeah. so there are <laughs> going to be uh, that level of detail to it. But having looked at it as an outsider uh, at the moment, I think it's a pretty sensible uh, lay down, and I think it's one that most here in the room would agree with if they had a chance to look at it. Have you been surprised? I mean, I'm always surprised at the sort of vulnerabilities that exist sort of right next to something that's incredibly fortified. So, yeah. you know, we think about layered defenses in, say, airports. This is what I think about, right? So you, you, you know, w the moment you're at the TSA line, you, uh, so much has already happened. So that physical check, we already know who you are. You've already, you know, you, there's now burdened and unburdened classes. Those of you who have TSA pre-check, you're unburdened so you can go through quicker. So there's so many layers of it, but there is a moment when you go from hard to soft yeah. for an airports that tends to be um, um, uh, the, the public entrance right, way. You, walk just, in, you can't, you right. can't, I mean, you just, there's no way you could fortify it and baggage claim areas and things like that. Have you been surprised at, at how, how this entire infrastructure has built and you just, you have the hardened right next to the, oh, we're going to send you our thing, you know, we're going to enter the supply chain through unencrypted Gmail. Yeah, I have been. Yeah. Um, I think the analogy pertains in cyber. I, I will make a point. I was looking at a company the other day, by the way, which 
is coming up with a technology that actually can uh, scan large crowds. Yeah. Because this, the challenge you elicit occurs not only at airports, think about football stadiums, mm -hmm. uh, large gathering places, our schools. Um, there are technologies that are coming out that are kind of hyperspectral analysis techniques that will be able to, to, to scan large crowds of people as they move along. To the cyber world, you can't do that yeah. without the, uh, the, the artificial intelligence that can drive it, can instantly do that hyperspectral analysis and say, yes, that individual has something metallic or has something that looks like a can of gasoline. All these are possible. So part of the answer to the question is um, technology that will help us move the barrier out. But I think your point is um, it is... Uh, unsettling that we have these that we have these gaps and we ought to address them and I think in the world of cyber what this comes down to is um, having both point security solutions yeah. think the hazmat suit that you walk around in to make sure you don't get coronavirus but you also have to have the vaccine if you will in this metaphor yeah. you have to have inside you have to be able to protect that data, that life system in each of you as an individual. And this gets back to this idea, for example, of end-to-end -end encryption. Currently, your data is unencrypted on the servers. That's the life system inside you. If we could move to system that has encryption end-to-end, -end, that would be an example of yeah. what you could do. Um, and I think we've got to go in that direction. And all of it is really technology, and the government can help by facilitating that, by R&D, doing grants, energizing, for example, the Department of Defense, which ought to have a high level of interest in the technology I mentioned a moment ago of scanning large crowds. Would that be useful, say, in Afghanistan? <laughs> yeah. You bet. So technology and government policy, I think, are the answers here. I mean, do you, you've, you've avoided, it's very interesting, not avoided, maybe not purposefully, but this idea of sort of sanctioning. I mean, so we've been talking about carrots and not sticks for sure. government. Um, but the kind of responsibility and uh, that, say, these companies have um, in terms of both supplying the Defense Department or any other agency with information, but also being a, a, a vulnerable, you know, sort of single point of failure for, for the Defense Department. I mean, do you see, when you think about the regulatory state, do you see, you know, government coming in much stronger in terms of, you know, beyond mere certification? Um, well, first of all, we ought to recognize that there's a philosophical uh, gap here yeah. between the two parties. Yeah. And so part of the answer to the question lies in the election in November. I think uh, historically, the Democrats obviously have been much more oriented toward regulation across every sphere. And so if there's a Democrat president, uh, look for more regulation on this side. And then if it's a Republican, if, if the president wins re-election, the chances are they'll be less inclined. Here's my argument. In this world, in cyber, we have got to get more regulated. And, and we tend to think, again, back to these, these wonderful supercomputers, we tend to think, oh, we're so advanced. This, this is incredible, and this thing is incredible, right? It can communicate point to point anywhere in the world. It can access all the world's knowledge. It can play any symphony ever recorded. It's measuring my heartbeat right now. I can look at a really funny video of a basset hound right now. <laughs> but it's in a system, it's in an ecosystem that is very primitive still. In, to switch metaphors, we're still on the beach at Kitty Hawk. Yeah. in a lot of ways here. In a maritime metaphor, we're sailing a cyber sea and there aren't a lot of buoys out there and there aren't a lot of lighthouses. And that means regulation. So to stay on the seas as an analogy, for centuries the seas were largely unregulated until we created a, a massive global law of the sea treaty. Right. At some point, we are going to have to drive more regulation into this ecosystem. So it seemed like CM... MC, the program that we were talking about before, might be the beginning. It's exactly. a certification. You know, you could be this level, you could be that level. You have to be some level. We're not going to just right. take your word for it. Could be the beginning of people 
uh, of the government demanding of the supply chain, yes. at the very least encryption or, you know, end-to-end yep. um, -end encryption on all things, right? Not just communication. Absolutely. With, most of us use WhatsApp, but you know, on documents and other things like that. It, absolutely correct. And what I am also seeing, because in the end, cybersecurity is the ultimate team sport. It's yeah. the ultimate private-public partnership. What's encouraging to me, Juliet, is the number of industries that are moving towards self-regulation in this regard. Yeah. I'll give you an example. Yeah. The eight biggest banks in the country got together, right. pooled quite a bit of capital, and created an organization, small but very capable organization, called the FSARC, mm -hmm. Financial Service Analysis and Resilience Center, hired an absolute top flight cybersecurity leader, and then went around and hired people from DHS, from CIA, from DOJ, from other forms of law enforcement, and they hired high-end technologists. Still a small organization, but its mission is to look at all these attack surfaces coming after the banks, make recommendations, and then go to the big banks and through them to the entire banking industry and say, Here's what we're seeing, here are the dangers, here's how you harden yourself against it. And as an industry, they're starting to talk about something like CMMC for the financial sector. I'm seeing the edges of the same thing in the electric grid, in yep. the electric industry, yeah. you're probably seeing that. I'm seeing conversations beginning in the water industry. And you know, we tend to think a little bit less about water critical infrastructure, Newsflash, you can live a long time without electricity. Yeah. You know, like 30, 60, your whole life if you have to. How long can you live without clean, potable Three water? Days. Three days. Yeah. So there are significant challenges from cyber in that world as well, for example. So in addition to your excellent point of the government beginning to do more and more here, we're now starting to see the industries themselves become more self-policing. Which is incredible when you think about the inherent competition amongst oh, all of them. Exactly. But it is true that um, beginning with our first points about people's confidence in institutions right now. Um, and if the institution seems vulnerable, whether physically vulnerable, so your sense of confidence after 9-11 was low because we seem physically vulnerable or vulnerable because you know, someone or some country was able to get into a system that they ought not to have gotten into. Right. Um, that will apply to the military as much as banking. And I, mean, I have to ask you, as we're seeing here, so you're, uh, I, I teach at the Kennedy School. You are the dean of, a, uh, of the Fletcher School. I mean, do you, uh, in the education space, uh. it would seem both that you, you know, how do you get people to think about cybersecurity as a policy issue, mm -hmm. right? But also educational institutions as, vulnerab as public vulnerabilities. Yeah, let me take the first part of that. Um, and so educationally, I started uh, coding when I was in my 20s, all the way back in the 1970s, also known as 1.2 million years ago. <laughs> Uh, and I was, I was actually in a classroom with uh, Rear Admiral Grace Hopper, Amazing Grace, the mother of COBOL. Hmm. Um, I trained in electrical engineering at Annapolis and because the term computer scientist didn't exist. So I'm a lifelong engaged in this sphere. When I got to be the dean of the Fletcher School, I found lots of really smart people who wanted to talk about policy yeah. and all the policy issues and the deterrence issues and the geopolitics and so on. I found almost nobody who wanted to marry up the policy issues with the technical yeah. issues. So we created a, a, a master's degree at the Fletcher School jointly with Tufts University's computer science department. So it's a master's in cybersecurity, but before you graduate, you got to know how to code. You got to understand how that email gets from that supercomputer to, you know, my grandmother's iPhone down in Florida. Um, technically, you got to be able to describe it, understand the vulnerabilities. So I think that we are overweight in the academy, you yeah. know, in the Harvards and the Tufts and the a variety of other really high-end institutions. We're overweight on the policy side. We're underweight on the yeah. technical side. Right. Uh, creating degree programs that bring those disciplines together, I think, is crucial. Yes, and and um, 
it, that's exactly right that you, I, people will ask me uh, about my career and I always say, you know, get your hands dirty for some period of time. People who sort of go through policy schools, you know, don't, if you don't know how the wires connect or you don't know, you know, what it means to run an incident command in a crisis or whatever it is, you're not going to understand essentially what people are doing for you if yeah. you're in a leadership position or something. The, the, it, it, it does, what, what you were saying though, this idea that, oh, what, people in cybersecurity do is tech technical and I'm the policy thinker and there's no, there's a gap between them. I, I often tell an, an anecdote that I get, I do a lot of preparedness consulting, even if it's cybersecurity, that I had a, a conversation with a CEO once and a lot of you probably struggle with this, those of you who are in companies that do not view themselves as security companies, but you're the security person or the CISO or, um, uh, I asked the CEO, I said, how often do you meet your CEO? He goes, oh, you know, the multiple times a day, right? And then uh, how often do you meet with your CFO? Well, no less than two times a week we have a scheduled meeting. So what about your, your chief security officer, your chief information security officer? He literally said this to me, he goes, he's former FBI, he knows what he's doing. Yeah. I mean, you just you could not imagine a <laughs> totally CEO right. saying that about their CFO totally right. or their COO, right? You take a reason, but this idea that, well, that's something that, experts know, and I have no responsibility to know it. You just, you couldn't imagine that in any other space. You cannot, and um, I, I'm on the board of a large financial institution. It's called Newberger Berman. It's kind of like T. Rowe Price or Fidelity, manages a bunch of different investments. Uh, pretty good size, Wall Street firm. And we, as a board member, my mission has been exactly that yeah. point, and now our CISO, comes to every board meeting, and believe me, if the CISO is talking to the board, the CEO is highly interested in that yes. conversation. And, and I think, Juliet, that the FEC, the, the Federal Exchange Commission that oversees governance in the United States, I think before too long will mandate that public boards have at least one individual with real provable expertise in cyber and cybersecurity, just like public boards are required to have people who have auditing experience, who head the audit committee. If you're gonna run a risk committee on a public or a big private firm, my view, there ought to be a cybersecurity expert on the board. That um, increases the level of interest and attention that the C-suite has to this. And it, I think that light is going on, yeah, and it's back to how business um, is increasingly addressing this and figuring it out. So we are, um, shockingly, down to three minutes, so I just want to give you an opportunity to um, you know, about your thoughts when you look at, we went from sort of global threats to the very tactical threats and, and boardrooms. George, is, you know, is there something that when you look at the threats that we face in both the public and private sector from both governments, outside governments and individual actors, is there, uh, you know, is there a through line that we could be thinking about? Is there a connective tissue or any advice that you can give as yeah. people read headlines? And, you know, you've been in this field a long time. I've been in it a long time. Like, you know, we, we know how to process noise and prioritize yeah. threats. So I, this may or may not surprise you as, as you've heard the conversation unfold, you know that I worry a great deal about cybersecurity and I do. I worry a lot about Syria, Afghanistan, Libya, the Balkans, and I have touched all of those crises and many more in a long misspent youth in the Navy. Um, here's my point to your question. I think the number one threat to the United States of America, and we've touched on it, is polarization. Yeah. It is this angry political season in which we find ourselves. And I'm a centrist. I'm a registered independent. I was vetted for vice president by Hillary Clinton, one of six people actually vetted. And then I was offered a cabinet post by Donald Trump. I think of that, by the way, as kind of two bullets whizzing <laughs> by my head. <laughs> And so we ought to be asking ourselves as Americans, how do we get out of this? And we've touched on a couple of different ideas, including education. I, I want to go back to the idea of service as I close. And, and my observation is as follows. And here, by the way, I'm talking to you. Whether you are a Fox News watching, you get up in the morning and you watch Fox and Friends and the folks on the white couch and you can't imagine an evening where you haven't heard from Sean Hannity by the end of the night, or 
If you are an MSNBC, uh, got to watch Morning Joe, and the last thing you hear before you nod off is Rachel Maddow. I'm talking to you across that whole spectrum. We have got to find a way to have conversations where we can disagree without being intensely disagreeable, without personalizing everything, without lying about things. We have got to find our way back. So I'll close with a thought in which a portion of that can happen, and it's the idea of service as follows. People say to me all the time, and I appreciate it, Admiral, thank you for your service. I spent 37 years in the Navy, and I'm proud of that. People say that a lot. Here's my point. There are so many ways to serve this country. Our civil servants, like Assistant Secretary, sitting right here to my left. How about our diplomats, CIA officers, NSA officers, our Peace Corps volunteers? How about our police, our firemen? How about teachers? Teachers in rural South Carolina teaching a packed classroom for $36,000 a year. You think they're serving the country? I do. And I'll tell you, as I close, we ought to think about service as something we can agree on. Service is bipartisan. Service is nonpartisan. So my ask of you is when you meet people who are serving the country in a positive, significant way, thank them. Thank a teacher for his service. Thank a police officer for her service. Service is part of the path from this angry political season. Last thought, don't for a minute believe that what you are doing yeah. for cybersecurity is not service to the nation, because it is. Because we are vulnerable, as Juliet and I have talked about for an, almost an hour. You are part of defending the country. You are serving the country. So I'll close our wonderful hour together yes. with gracious thanks to the Assistant Secretary. I'll close by saying to all of you, thank you for your service in keeping this country safe. Thank you very much. Pleasure thank meeting you. with you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much.